Hopefully Santa brought you everything you uh, wanted for Christmas. He certainly left a nice present for all of us as we're here to review Sheffield United 2, Luton 3. To help me do that, I've got the Lutonian journalist James Cunliffe and town fan Dan Barrett-Davis with me. Gents, hope you had a good Christmas. Couldn't get any better, could it, really? Very nice, thank you, yeah. Shall we do this? Let's go for it. Hit the go intro, James. Can you believe it? We are Premier League! Yes! I love this town. I love this town. I love this, this town. Do you know what I love about this town? It's actually you. Everyone in it has got this massive soul. We're Luton people. Hello everyone, welcome along to the Sheffield United Review podcast, uh, absolutely fantastic away day on Boxing Day, uh, making it six points um, for Christmas. Before we get stuck into the game, thanks very much to everyone who's uh, sent us comments, particularly in light with the Newcastle review that we did, it was obviously different, it was um, ad hoc but it had to be done just because of the way Christmas was. So we're glad that you enjoyed it and we thank you for all your comments and everything else. And we may well look to do more of those in 2024. But for now, Sheffield United away. James, in the preview podcast, we said it was must win. Mm -hmm. It looked an easy game to start off with. The town were absolutely in cruise control. Then they brought the chaos. And then we said, no, we're the team that has <laughs> the chaos. And in the end... The right result, really. Absolute Christmas cracker of a second half, wasn't it? It was yeah. bonkers. Um, and I'm glad it went the right way. Finally, Luton get the luck they deserve, I think. Yeah, I think so. Dan, uh, I have a funny feeling you've got a similar view of the game to me, considering you were sat one seat right in front of me mm -hmm. on Tuesday. Um, we always start off with the team selection, and obviously it filtered through very quickly that Marvellous Nakamba now has a knee problem. Yep. That they're being a bit coy with, which immediately tells you that there's uh, some longer lasting effects of that. But we didn't mind that so much because we still had Ross and Samby in the centre of the park. And indeed, the only change from the team that started on Saturday was Ryan Giles in for another injured player, Issa Kabore. Mm. And of course, we had two goalkeepers on the bench because uh, Jordan Clark was ill uh, on the morning of the game. Yeah, But the team itself, when you looked at it, 1-11, to 11, I think we were all pretty confident we could get the job done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's always that danger that Sheffield United could spring a surprise on us. Let's face it, you know, they, they have that in the locker. We saw when they played at Villa the other night that they've got that in the locker and they can do it um, with the new manager coming in. Well, I say new manager, Wilder's has been there before and done it with them. So the, the, he's, he's a manager they'll play for. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm sure they'll play for him after his post-match comments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Admittedly, haven't bothered with that one. <laughs> well, I hope I hope his defenders have bothered with it because, um, um, dear well, me, here's the uh, bus and uh, you're getting shoved under it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not always easy with managers doing that to players. I think stuff like that should be kept in-house, but it was painstakingly obvious to all the 31,000 people in that ground that the, the defending was having a day off. <laughs> for I mean, those two own goals I mean you, you don't go 2-1 up at home and then score two own goals in in a matter of minutes well and you do if you're Sheffield United thankfully well you do yeah you do and thankfully it worked for us uh, but going back to the, the team selection yeah it was a obviously most of us expecting Nakamba to come back from suspension f following the Newcastle match but like you say if, if there is an ongoing knee problem you've got to be careful with it because your knees you, well you need them don't you <laughs> and uh, you, you don't want it to. You don't want to play him in amongst these these like games and short spaces of time, and then risk a further long term injury. And that's why you have a squad. Um, luckily, Lacong is back in, and he seems to have tucked to it, took to it like a duck to water. I thought he was excellent against Newcastle, and he, him and Barkley again yesterday, absolutely brilliant, and controlled the midfield for large parts of the game. I felt. Got a funny feeling we're going to speak an awful lot about Albert Sambi Lakonga both in this podcast and the ones to come, that is for sure. Um, James, we asked for a similar first half to the first half that we got at Bournemouth and we got exactly that. It was controlled, it was classy, there was so much to like about our play. Thankfully, Chris Wilder was blind that 
their left hand side was getting absolutely battered every single time we went forward and you kind of felt in the early stages it was just a matter of time before we scored I mean Kaminsky could have joined the away end for the first half an hour (laughs) there was literally nothing (laughs) coming um, our way it was just a matter of time that we put one of those moves together and and it resulted in something nearly uh, got Eli in didn't we and um, and eventually I mean Sambi rolls a lovely ball into Doughty he stands up the left back who wasn't much of a left back really was he and um straight past him and then well I don't even know what the goalkeeper's doing probably um, thinking about the time he's had cramp all of uh, all of the times but thankfully uh, didn't close his legs early enough and um, down to his first Premier League goal and really deserved because his performances this season have been absolutely different class they have ever since he got back into the side after you know Giles started the first couple of games he's really taken the opportunity and he's been a standout performer. You know, we've called for him to be in the England set up. Uh, we don't do that in jest. We do that because his performance has been absolutely fantastic. So, um, yeah, and he's been performing really well in the last couple of games and makes it all the more odd, really, that they sort of gave him that much space. I mean, long may it continue. I'm all for it. But mm. why, why are you giving Alfie Doughty that much space? It's unbelievable. But um, disregard what I've just said to all you uh, Premier League managers, if you happen to watch this, uh, because we want him running at, at, at players like he ran at Gus Hamer, who, um, who's a cracking player. We highlighted him in the preview uh, piece and he was really good then. Uh, but he left him spinning like a top um, to get past him. And uh, yeah, the shot through the through the legs, that's cheeky as you like, love it. And uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure many of the, many people sort of knew it was a goal for about five seconds. But we didn't, was, no, <laughs> we, we all had the discussion, didn't we? The, the, I mean, it, I knew it, it, it looked, was, well, I was pretty convinced it was in, right? So I, was, I started to cheer and then everyone around me is still sat on their ass and I'm like, oh, have I got this wrong? Has it gone round the back of the goal? And then Alfie started wheeling away, telling the bloke in the corner who's giving him dog's abuse to um, pipe down. Yeah. And then suddenly the Luton fans realise and we all yeah, we start it, cheering. It was a bit odd. I, I remember you cheering and I thought, oh, if if I cheer, it's going to be one of those that has gone beyond the goal and then bounced off the advertising order in, in the back of the net. Um, but yeah, what, watching it back on the replay, uh, as a goalkeeper, you don't, let you near post and you certainly don't let it through your legs like that. And if you actually look at Doughty when he's when he before he strikes it, he's looking to play it across the goal as well. So it's it's even better. It just makes it even better. And yeah. <laughs> it was quite comical just from that as he scored. I was worried. Oh yeah, he has me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly that. And I mean, you know, as I say, <clears throat> really good goal. It was coming. You know, we'd had a few sort of half chances or moments that just needed that little bit of luck we'd obviously we'd, we'd got Eli through hadn't we and the Bosnian defender who I'm still name I'm still not going anywhere near <laughs> took him out <laughs> Amazing. And, and got got booked otherwise he was clean through and prob- probably going to get a shot on a uh, shot on goal away um Townsend was so clever he was picking up spaces in pockets that they didn't know whether it was a midfielder or a center back a left back or who should go with him and he was just having a whale of a time and Really, in that first half, apart from the Hamer free kick, I don't really think they offered anything to the game, did they? They were absolutely, considering the magnitude of the game Mm. and the fact that they played Friday night, we played Saturday afternoon, they offered absolutely nothing to the game in that first half. First hour, really. Yeah, which is bizarre. It's a contrast to when we played them last year when it was a bit more of a fight, I felt. Um, Whether their confidence has been absolutely battered this season, given by how it's not gone very well for them. Um, perhaps that's something to do with it. But yeah, they, they they look they look a team like they need a window. Do you know what I mean? I, th- I think they need a window and judging by Wilder's reaction, as you say, it looks like there's going to be some movement. <laughs> what a window to jump out of. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they look like a team to me that need the championship. I don't yeah. know about... Uh, well, I think, I, th- I think they might get the wish because um, if, if you're a Sheffield United fan, I'm sorry, but you, you're not going to be very impressed with that at all. Not at all. No, well, I mean, the, the natives were getting restless, weren't they? And, you know, there was all sort of jeering. I mean, they were getting pissed off, weren't they? Because the goalkeeper weren't getting rid of the ball very quickly. But the simple fact was he had no one to give it to because we were man for man on all of them like we do. We picked up our players right from the start. Sometimes this season it's taken us 
10, 15 minutes to work out whose man is who. And if not on this occasion, Rob got it absolutely spot on. And um, yeah, we just, it was, you could almost, obviously we weren't at Kenilworth Road, but the domination of the first half, it was almost like it was at Kenilworth Road. You know, you had Barkley have an absolute whale of a time in the middle of the park. Sambi Laconga, the boy can play with roller skates on. He's that good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Very good. <laughs> they had three, they had three in the centre, didn't they? They could have had 33 in the centre and them two would still have bossed it. That Cruyff turn of Barkley's in the first half. I mean, he's, lo- he's loving football as, pretty much as much as I'm loving watching him play it. I mean, he just gets better and Bennett better, doesn't he? He's um, <clears throat> such a classy player. And Lukonga as well is what we thought we'd be getting. We're, I'm a bit gutted that we didn't get to see the Dikamba, Lukonga and Barkley axis that we were talking about. I mean, it will come, but obviously perhaps not anytime soon by the judging of what Edwards was saying about Nakamba, which is a bit of a shame. But, you know, while you've got Lukonga in there um, <clears throat> performing as he has done for only two and a half games, really, isn't he? And he's going to get better. Uh, and Barkley, who's just, he's bossed multi-million pound midfields all season, is not he, really? So it's it's a very exciting prospect. Yeah, and, and they utterly dominated that United side on Tuesday. And uh, yeah, you mentioned Townsend as well, some some very, very intelligent play without the ball uh, to, to really open up spaces and, yeah, doubt he was the beneficiary of that umpteen times in the first half. I mean, that's two games on the trot for Townsend because he kept on coming inside and Dan, uh, on Saturday and Dan Byrne didn't know whether to come inside or not come inside. I mean, having seen his defending against Knott's Forest, I don't even know he, if, if he knows how to defend, <laughs> let alone come inside or anything else. <laughs> but Kabore had the whole of that right-hand side to himself in that first half. Alfie Doughty had that. So it's clearly a plan and Townsend is so clever that maybe... The midfield that we need to look forward to seeing more and more often and this is no disrespect to Marva Tor because we love him and you know we really hope that his injury isn't too bad maybe the midfield we need to look forward to seeing more of is the Ross Sambi Townsend trio because I mean they're all clever players they're all great players and they're all in good form and the good thing is only Ross really is anywhere near 100% I think they both said or certainly Townsend has said to you hasn't he that he's still getting his way up to 100% and he, it's, it's obvious that Sambi Lukonga is only played two and a half games no one's at 100% after two and a half games so if those two have still got more in them and Barkley stays at the form that he is and there's no signs to suggest that he's not going to that's a midfield that no one else in the bottom half of the table can match up to nobody no, you're right. And I think I think we are going to see a lot of it, to be fair, by the judging of it. We're a couple of days away from Rob's press conference pre-Chelsea where he'll probably let us know more about what the situation is with the camera. But yeah, I, I think it, it will be. And it's a very exciting prospect, um, you know, with, uh, with um, the t- two experienced Premier League players that we've got who are really performing at a high level. And you can see that well, Ross has said it that he loves playing here, in, and and so has Andros in recent weeks, and he said it on telly and stuff, and various interviews and stuff. But I think, you know, words can you can you can ignore the words and just look at their celebration for the third goal at Bramall Lane and what that meant to those players. They've been there and done it all over the play, all over the Premier League, and that meant the world to those two players, and it's great to see. Yeah, I mean, that that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, you know, they've got England caps galore. Mm. You know, they've, li- they've literally done everything they can. They've been to World Cups. They've been to, you know, big tournaments, played in big finals and everything else. But they're desperate to keep Luton in the Premier League, not for, for themselves, because they're not going to enhance themselves at their age by keeping Luton in the Premier League. But because they want to keep Luton in the Premier League because they've fallen in love with the club. They get what it's all about. And, uh, well, we can only benefit from it. Yeah, exactly. And isn't it nice that, I mean, we we have we have been blessed with players that have come here and got the club and fallen in love with it. Um, and with greatest respects to all those players, they haven't quite got the class that Townsend and Barkley have got with it, which gives you an even bigger added bonus. We've got England internationals, well, ex-England internationals, whatever you want to call them. They've represented the country at the highest level. They've played at the highest level all their careers. And for one reason or another, fell off, fell off the train a little bit, and Luton's come along. Here you go, do you fancy 
couple of years more, you know, do you want to carry it on sort of thing? And, you know, as a footballer in your 30s, you sort of take the opportunity, you can grab whatever opportunity you can grab really. And it, it's worked out for both parties and obviously like, long may it continue. It's been fantastic. Yeah, I think I'm pushing my luck. Watch. I think I'm pushing my luck asking for Andros Townsend to go to the Euros. But it's, if Ross Barkley does not get in that England squad for the Euros, he's either injured or Gareth is just flat out doesn't want to win the tournament. It's uh, <laughs> well, it'll be the latter. It, it's it's that simple. <laughs> I mean, the football Barkley's playing. He was man of the match. Give a man of the match again on the Amazon Prime coverage. Yet again, Townsend referenced that he's in a different world to everyone else and. We said it right at the start and we'll repeat ourselves very often, you know, if we got 60% of the Barkley that was at Everton, we'd have a damn good player. Well, we got 80% of him and there might even still be more to come and it's absolutely fantastic to see. Just on Townsend, he kept on going in that second half as well, didn't he? Yeah. And actually I thought he was going to put us 2-0 up. He had one shot that fizzed just over the crossbar shortly after half time. And if that had gone in, that was game over, game set match, because they'd have just, I mean, we saw what happened when we went 3-2 up. They all disappeared. They all had a fire drill. <laughs> had um, <laughs> had Townsend put us 2-0 up, the alarm would have been sounding a lot earlier. Yeah, possibly. And, you, you know, that that's only that's only a good thing for us. I mean, we've seen, obviously, from his goal against Newcastle, right, it's a tap in, it's a header from two yards out, you, you unmarked and you're not going to miss those. Um but obviously having a chance early on, you're one nil up, you get a chance early on, you bury that away from home. There's it's very very little chance of Sheffield United getting back in the game after that. We we were kind of masters of the downfall, I think, for a little period there. We're a little mad moment where for the first goal particularly, we just couldn't get rid of it. Just couldn't get rid of it. I think it was on the line at one point. We had two players fighting to get rid of it and they couldn't quite get the heels behind it to really smack it. Um but yeah, like you say, if Townsend does score his game over, he didn't. We ended up on a on our backs a little bit. They came into the game and come right at us, and it took a master stroke from Edwards to sort of substitutions to turn the game back on its head, back in our favour. And you know, hats off to Edwards and the team for doing that. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I mean, it's just turned chaotic. It's from absolute <laughs> calmness and Was. cruise control. It just turned chaotic, didn't it? There's, there's, there's a bit of pinballing around our box and all of a sudden the ball's broken to McAtee, I think it was, on the right-hand side, who picks out McBurney. Doesn't hit the cleanest strike in the world, but obviously he's close enough that uh, Kaminsky's got no chance with it. Finds the corner. And then the second one was the one that Dan referred to where Brown yeah. and Mengi were sliding in and hope you just hoped that someone got it around the post, but it never happened. And then the Bosnian bloke, who's clearly much better in their box than he is, sorry, in our box than he is their mm -hmm. box. <laughs> You know, he couldn't really miss either, could he? But it came from nowhere. I, I wasn't sitting there thinking, we're going to be hanging on for dear life here. But then the next thing you know, it five, what was it, five, six, seven minutes between the two goals? All of a sudden, oh shit, we've blown this and it's going to be a long way back. Well, that's what it felt like at the time. Uh, it, not now, obviously, but at the time it felt like they'd definitely blown it because the momentum then sort of should take, United all the way through and to he it. just knew that oh, they've got a reputation for time wasting. Mm. You know, if you if you let that start, the goalkeeper's world class at it. You let that start and you're like... Thankfully, they weren't doing that. I yeah. told them they weren't doing that. I, and I don't know what it is with gifting Ollie McBurney goals when he really needs one because Luton seems to be doing that. Because, Did it last year. Oh, he hadn't scored for about five million years last year. <laughs> <laughs> By the time Luton played him and he scored. And this time again, it's just like, um, a couple of players around McAtee and somehow he still digs out a little cross when he sat on his ass. It's just one of the most frustrating things because it you know it gets them back in when they didn't really deserve it. But then to concede a second one eight minutes later, is and the, it was the closeness of the two goals. You're thinking, well, that that's the moment. That's the the game's gone now because. You can't dominate that much in a first period against a relegation rival, not put them completely away, and then they do that. I've seen enough games to, I think we probably all have to to know that that te that would usually be the end of it. Um, so for what happened after it to transpire was um, absolutely bonkers, really. But I'm glad it did because um, it just makes everything seem a lot rosier now, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I'm, I think my biggest concern. 
when they went 2-1 up wasn't necessarily so much of time wasting you know we do it we'd do it in the same position you know obviously um it was more the fact that they played Friday night we played Saturday afternoon going into it so you would have thought they'd be the fresher side mm. but so many people write off the fitness of this squad and um they showed their fitness yet again okay I know Rob made three substitutions which really impacted the game in a positive way but you know the logic would have said that having had the extra whatever it was 24 hours to recover and prepare at a busy time of uh, of of the year that they'd have seen the game out but i mean thankfully their right their radar went 180 didn't it and mm. instead of shooting at our goal they couldn't stop shooting at their own goal <laughs> and uh, they're frustrating goals to concede no matter who you are and to do it twice in a matter of minutes at home when you were two and up and ultimately deciding the game that that's got to hurt them. That's got to hurt them. And it, it's going to be, you know, the, it, and it's weird. Like I said earlier, the way they played at Villa Park for that, I was sort of thinking, well, hang on a minute, we're going to be in a right game here. And we were, um, but the, they were the masters of their downfall. And, and a lot of credit has to go to Luton for that because we just didn't give up. You know, you go two one down after after cruising at half time. You know, you one nil up. You go in the second half. You know, you still so, we were still sort of in control. Then we conceded two stupid goals, and then you know you sort of think, oh, bugger, <laughs> really got to get back into this somehow. Um, a lot of teams can roll over, and then you know they they can lose momentum and not quite get back into the game. And it wasn't a particularly clean cross cross from Morris either. He sort of weaker foot, left footed cross in and the defender just managed to beat Osho to it and somehow it sailed in. And you, you can say, oh, Blades fans might be watching this thinking, you know, you, you were lucky. and But sometimes you need that. And that you ride your luck with it and you take whatever chances you can get. And if you're gifted two chances like that, I mean, it, it's just really unlucky on their part. And yeah, that's, I mean, that's what decides it in the end. If there are any Blaze fans who are watching this, if you want to score a couple of goals for us, crack on. You know, <laughs> don't bother me. Couldn't care less how it gets in the back of the net as long as it gets in the well, that's back it. of the net. I mean, we were the wit for the woodwork away from winning 3 0 against Newcastle, weren't we? So I'm sure as hell not, as Andros Townsend said, I couldn't really give a shit about luck because, you know, it'll all even itself out. Well, but it, we, it did, it did, does. we did get a bit, where we did get a bit lucky, not so much the finishes. We did get lucky for that second one because the referee's got himself in a bit of a muddle, hasn't he? It's a free kick on Chio, but he's given a corner where the goal comes from. It's recycled back out. And like Dan says, Morris crosses the ball over. And um, Robinson uh, had a moment or two off from taking long throws and nodded it in for us. Mm. And um, then you thought, oh, there's only one winner now. And it's in the blue shirts again. Yeah, momentum totally shifted at that point. And... Um, yeah, I, I don't know why they were making so much of a big deal about that. It, it was a Luton ball. It should have been a Luton free kick because Gio got fouled. It ended up as a corner. So arguably you could say the Blades had a better chance of defending that because a corner's a little bit more difficult to pull off. Not for Luton because they're bloody grey at set pieces. But you get a, a, a free kick a little bit um, set back from the byline. That's probably harder to defend. So I don't know what they're really complaining about there. It should have been a foul, whatever. But... Um, yeah, it took it don't, face really, off. Don't, it don't really matter. It ended up a, ended up the right way, and um, uh, yeah, I don't really buy the thing where Wilder's saying they threw it away because the substitute of Chio and Morris turned that pressure on. Because you get Chio on any pitch, and he'll stretch the game, and he did. Um, and then Morris really, although I don't really want to see strikers out in those positions crossing the ball what what he does have is a striker's instinct for knowing I would have wanted the ball in there at that point because yeah. you could easily say that he um, gets the ball turns back passes the ball back in in field and and they try and reset and it just goes a bit sideways for a little bit not badly sideways I mean passing it sideways but instead of that he just whips it around wraps a foot around it and you never know what could happen. So um, at that stage with uh, Robinson flinging his head on it, um, it was game on. It, oh, you reckon it was going in, didn't he? So, um, yeah, I think it would as well. I mean, what we saw of the goalkeeper in the first half, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't um, back his chances of catching a beach ball, let alone a football. Um, 
and then comes the winning goal and it's mm. identical really isn't it Morris. you know ball into morris who um puts some sort of weird cross like thing over and it just pings off of Slomani and time stopped didn't it it just it just floated and floated and floated and we had the perfect angle of it yeah we did we yeah. knew it was going in <clears> but you just kind of expected the goalkeeper to come along and just push it punch it do something with it because he had all day and all night to go and get yeah it. and then you're like well, he ain't coming <laughs> and, then, it, and it, then it drops over the fella on the line and in even if you know as took a deflection as a goalkeeper you, you should really be moving yeah. moving across for it but I just don't think he was something's going on with him I think must be something going on because it, that, was, that was probably one of the worst goalkeeping displays I've seen for for the three Absolutely. goals the, the way they conceded the three goals I mean he's been pony all season though I mean, well, I've only seen the highlights but he's just dropped some clangers yeah he has um, and you know last season I thought he was quite solid for him from what little I saw of Sheffield United, I thought he was quite solid and difficult to beat, but this year it just seems like you just, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, t I'll try and catch it, but I'm not very good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fingers. And it, 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 it's weird. It's, it's really weird because, you know, you, sh you should be saving those and most good goalkeepers would save those. Premier League goalkeepers, you'd expect them to save most of those shots. You certainly don't want to let them through your legs. And you, you'd guarantee that most of the top keepers would get something on it unless you're an Anna. Well, to be honest, I think I'd rather have him than um, that bloke. The, <laughs> the crazy thing was, though, that he seemed to get let off scot-free from Wilder's um, rant after the game, and it was all about his back four, wasn't it? I mean, well, well, they were shoddy. They were. It's, it's, it's easy to blame the goalkeeper as well, isn't it? Uh, yeah, they were, but I mean, it's the goalkeeper's fault for the first one and mm. nobody else's, you know. Uh, every goalkeeper at any level should be keeping that out. Obviously, we're glad he didn't. And, you know, I mean, ultimately, the goal for all that it's um, an own goal and it's a header close in, the goalkeeper could still come and claim it. But obviously, after what happened to him on Friday night, he weren't leaving his line at all. And then the third one, I mean, as I say, to me, it looked like he had all day long to go and get it and, just do something to get it round the post or over the bar or something. And it wasn't it just, like it was like a shot cross. No, it wasn't, wasn't going in. at pace. It was it was sort of curled in and it come off the like defender a hell of a lot slower than it hit the defender, didn't it? Yeah. And it's I don't know, but the the other key um, thing in order for us to see the game out, um, Robbers has brought Mads Anderson on at this point, and McBurney was a non-factor because you knew every single ball was coming into the box and into the box. Didn't win anything. Mads Anderson on the eve of his birthday won absolutely everything, much like he did against Newcastle on Saturday. It's kind of like some sports, particularly American sports, they have this sort of phrase, he's a closer, you know, they bring him on to like close the match out. That's uh, that's exactly the role that Mads Anderson's playing uh, with a plum at the minute. I don't know what to say, but I called it in the last podcast you that did. we were sat here, lads, that he's going to have a big part to play in the season now. And um, he, he absolutely did, and he, he's come on, and he's that is the sort of stuff that that is as good as when Chio and Morris were running the ball up into the corner flag against not, uh, Newcastle. It's the same sort of stuff because you know um, when they're flinging it, the kitchen sink at you in the last minute. Anything can go wrong, but when he's getting two solid heads on it, you can just sense it as that that, that that's the job done, and. Um, yeah, I mean, I really liked the look of him before he was getting, uh, before he got injured. Um, and he's young as well. And also the leadership qualities that he'll bring as well, because that's a young defence. Um, and they were great, don't get me wrong. Mengi's unbelievable. And Osho is a quality, quality footballer. Um, and he comes on and he's ex-captain of Barnsley. You'll have that leadership quality to, to bring and maybe even a calmness around uh, those sorts of situations. I know he's... Um, very big into his, um, you know, mental health and all, all that sort of stuff. So, um, not mental health. That's what I mean. He's Strength. Sort of, yeah, Strength. yeah. He's Strength sort of like uh, strongest uh, man in Luton, according the to the greatest guild. So, yeah, um, on the FIFA rankings, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad he's back, and I, I hope he has a really good influence. And I, if, in fact, I, I think, I, I think I know he will. Yeah, he will do. Um, and maybe that is his role because like you say, I mean, they're going to have to rename Ted, 
Ted and Mengi, Ted Beckenbauer, because he is so bloody good with the ball at his feet. It is untrue. Take, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he carried the ball, didn't he, against Newcastle the other day? And if he didn't run out of puff 30 yards from goal, he'd have kept on going. He'd have probably have tapped it in. It's like, but every single time the ball goes into a forward on the floor, he beats the forward to it. Doesn't have to like throw the forward out of the way or anything like that. Not like in the opposite situation with what they did with Eli when Eli got through so easily. But Mengi's just there. And then he's got Barkley or he's got Lakonga and, and we're away or he goes and carries it himself. I mean, I reckon Beckenbauer's got posters of him on his wall. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure of it. I mean, what a player. And then I watch the Man United game when I get home and they can't defend for Toffee and no. they've let him have us for ne next to nothing. I mean, mm. I'll never say a bad word about old Eric Ten Haggy ever again if uh, <laughs> if we're getting, getting players like that. I mean... How many more has he got that we can Yeah, have? absolutely. What a football. <laughs> none. Judging by what I've seen, none. No, but... Um, well, there'll it, be some in the under-21s, I'm sure, that are getting overlooked. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, I mean, we shouldn't be surprised by it. I, I, we are surprised sort of how good he is because of how young he is and he got thrown into it and he's had to just hit the ground running and he absolutely has. But we also shouldn't be surprised of it because... That's what Luton Town's recruitment team does, isn't it? I mean, they've done it countless times now and just finding gems. I mean, yeah, they used to find gems from the lower leagues, but now they're finding Premier League ready gems. Um, that's some hell of a talent they've got there and one hell of a player. Absolutely. I mean, what what a, what a player. And, um, you know, to be fair, Gabe Osho and Amari Bell, really, really good um, under the weight of all of that sort of aerial bombardment that... Um, that we got in the last 10 minutes. He saved an overhead kick, didn't he, Kaminsky, very, very late on. Mm. That was the, like a uh, kind of take your chance sort of overhead kick. It was apart from that, though, he didn't really have anything to do. That and the Hamer free kick were the only things he saved in the entire game, mm. really. And when you're away from home, yeah, okay, we don't want to concede two goals. But if your keeper's only facing four shots on target, yeah, you're taking that all day long. Yeah, it's not, it's not what you'd expect from a home side either, creating so few. Um, but that's testament to how we set up and how we played. Um, and I think if you're Kaminsky, you're happy if you're not got much to do anyway. You're not going to be happy you conceded two goals from it, but we got the we got the points, and that's first and foremost. But when when the guns are down, you you know you can rely on your goalkeeper, and Kaminsky's certainly earning his money, and he's a make, making an absolute mockery of his transfer fee. Yeah, that he is absolutely brilliant. When you consider you've got clubs that have paid eighty million quid for their goalkeepers. You've got little old Kaminsky who's basically bought on nectar points <laughs> <laughs> and he's delivering, he's, he's delivering, he's matching them, he more is. or less matching them. He is certainly on safe percentage. That's, um, that's for sure. He is, uh, he's going really, really well, um, Thomas Kaminsky. A couple of things that uh, I want to address before we uh, go on to individual players. Referee. We um, spoke about the referee in the preview show. First black referee since Uriah Rennie going on 15 years ago. Didn't really, uh, there were one or two moments, but over the course of a 90 minutes, didn't really notice he was there. Let the game flow. Um, all of those fancy like bits of contact that people try and go down for. He weren't having none of that. Booked players when they needed booking. Kind of kept everything in line. You know, I thought he refereed the game really, really well. I know there's the um, image doing the rounds of, um, their two defenders wanting Carl Morris's shirt in the corner but <laughs> apart from that I thought I thought he was a really really good referee certainly so much better than some of these other clowns that I've seen yeah I liked him I mean you can always tell a decent one when he's prepared to let the game flow in terms of um, just a couple of seconds before he blows a whistle see if an advantage develops and play it because you can always bring it back you don't have to be so whistle happy I thought from, from that perspective he was really good I, I said before and in the preview piece, I just want him to be anonymous. He largely was. I know that that image he said is doing the rounds of um, them absolutely throwing Morris to the ground and somehow winning a free kick, which is baffling. But by the end, the game was won, really, wasn't it? Well, that's the thing. Yeah, you want the big decisions, right? Don't you? You don't really care about the ones that are in the corner because at least then mm. you've got a chance to defend it if it is wrong. Yeah, and he got and change him. he got the big ones right, didn't he? The bookings that had to be booked he booked them and yeah I thought I thought he was really really good as a referee he wasn't helped out by his lino down the left hand side to the away fans he was absolutely terrible I don't know he must have had too much Christmas sherry that bloke but <laughs> uh, but the referee though 
for his debut as well in the Premier League. And this was a big game for the two clubs involved. It might not have been the biggest game in terms of, you know, the overall Premier League structure. But for the two teams involved, this was a, a, a must not lose, probably a six point must win, really. Mm. He handled it so, so well. And um, I hope we see more of him. Yeah. I mean, if, if I think all the other referees should look at him, look at his performance and I thought, well, hang on, maybe, maybe I've been going wrong somewhere. And I hope they do. The, the better ones will, the, the useless ones won't. Um, but yeah, that was probably one of the best referee performances I've ever seen. Yeah. And I, I'm not joking when I say that because we've seen some absolute toilet. Even this season, it's supposed to be the best league in the world. And we've got some of the most useless officials going. Now, it doesn't say much for his performance, obviously, but he was absolutely brilliant. Like you say, apart from a couple of things, there wasn't really anything major that you can pull him up on, I don't think. I mean, you go to football to see the best players doing their thing, don't yeah. you? You know, when... You're not there to see the rough. Exactly. If you're a Luton fan, you're there to see Barkley, you're there to see Townsend, you're there to see Le Congre. If you're a Sheffield United fan, you're there to see Hamer, McAtee, etc., etc. As long as those players are protected, you just, you know, let the game go. And he did. And I thought he was really, really good. Unfortunately, though, James, the game was soured uh, by an incident towards the end of injury time, which we now know to be an alleged racist slur aimed at Carlton Morris from someone in the home end. Now, we've had this already this season <clears throat> with Elijah Adebayo being racially abused on social media. Now, that's an absolute cop-out and we called it out straight away. But this is worse. This is in a football ground where they've got black players, we've got black players, there's a black referee, everyone knows about the profile of that particular incident. You must be a right clueless pillock to do it anyway. But to do it in those circumstances is just absolutely wrong and and I'm so glad that Sheffield United seem to be taking it seriously and I hope South Yorkshire Police who football fans will have absolutely zero faith in after what happened to Hillsborough mm. hopefully they uh, find the culprit and make sure he doesn't see another game of football live again well yeah I think the fact that Morris was alerting the referee to it at the time and, and they could point him out you'd, you'd think that that would be a, a, a useful thing um <laughs> It is, dis it is disappointing that we have to keep talking about this. I'm not surprised that it still happens, considering the rhetoric that goes on in the, the, the public and political sphere. I'm not going to get political again. Bloody hell, we've had enough of... Enough Hashtag stick to football. I had enough comments and the old stick to football game. That's what I'm saying on that. But um, w w it, it does seem to be rearing its ugly head again. Um, I guess... An incident like that where it's one person or we think it's one person, we don't know the full details yet, is easier to uh, sort out, weed out than it is when it's a whole section of fans doing it because that's more difficult. So hopefully that makes it a lot easier. The fact also that Morris was able to point it out at the time and, and there's all these protocols. But um, I, I, I honestly, I, it baffles me in any sphere or walk of life, not just football, but Ultimately, there's you're you're a fan in a in a stand watching a game that you supposedly love. You'd give anything to be one of those players. So how does it, I don't I don't understand can't get into the mindset of people how it equates that they're do they're doing a job and a thing that you would love to do. They're doing it better you. They're in the prime of their life. They're absolutely fantastic athletes. And um, how, how how does it come in that you're you're dishing out this abuse on the colour of skin. It just does. I just cannot compute it at all. Never have been able to. Um, it's just, just, it's just baffling. So hopefully, hopefully, they've got some sort of video evidence um, and they can find the guy and, and make an example of him. Because um, I mean, that's the only way you, you, it's going to sort of stop in football grounds. But in the rest of society, God knows. Yeah, I mean, he or she needs to have seen his last game of football live for a long, long time. Definitely. And like James said, you know, it, it's probably one of them things that you're never really going to get rid of. But if if they're consistent with it, if the players are reporting it, and and I say fans as well, I think if you hear something in a football ground of a racist nature, you've got to report it. There's yep. no, the, you know, and as long as the punishments are consistent, i.e. life ban from football grounds, you know, that that, that should help minimise it it should at least help minimise it and I'd, I'd love it I'd love to be sat here and talking and saying that you know we haven't had a racist incident for X amount of years or whatever um, but until 
you, you know they start getting really stiff on these people for it it's going to continue and that's it, it's really sad like james said i can't i can't comprehend why you'd have a go at somebody just because of the color of the skin or the background or whatever it doesn't matter or the only thing i think you can really have a go at an opposition player for is he don't play for you so you try and put him off but don't don't get racist with it no exactly that exactly it, absolutely that. this it's disgust it's vile it's, it's as bad as spitting yeah, that's the thing. There's discrimination of any kind is an absolute no no. All of these players have no room for racism on their shirts. Before the game, they all took the knee. And actually, to be fair to the Sheffield United fans, sometimes in these grounds, you hear booing, don't you? You didn't get that. They all cheered when it happened, and, and that was the right thing to do. Unfortunately, this wasn't. Well done, Carlton, for um, calling that out and making the referee and the, the authorities uh, aware of it. And obviously all Luton fans have your back and uh, we hope that it's dealt with in the serious nature that it should be dealt with. Let's go on to some individual performances. We've spoken a little bit about Alfie Doughty, but we didn't really get a chance to eulogise over Sambi Conga after the Newcastle game, which had we have done a full Newcastle preview, most of it mm -hmm. would have been on him. Yeah. You made that comment in the, um, in the review about <laughs> making him a cup of tea if you find him in bed with your missus. Well, <laughs> he, he, can, he can have my missus, I did. to be quite honest with you, if that's how he's going to play. I didn't find him at home when I got home. And, uh, but yeah, I would have made a cup of tea. She's but, good at covering <laughs> up. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, I mean, sorry, Mrs. C. <laughs> I no. said it earlier, he could play on roller skates. He is so silky and good and whatever the transfer fee is, stump it up. Just stump it up. And what is he, 24 years old? I mean, Arsenal if you played, what, 11 for him? Yeah, I mean, if you're thinking long-term, beyond just staying up this season and what we could achieve if we do stay up, this is a guy who's yet to reach his prime, who already looks damn good and seems to love playing for Luton already. I mean, let's get the deal done, lads, please. Yeah, it's it, he is so good. But n not just with the ball, he was fantastic against Newcastle. But I thought out of position in Sheffield United when things got tough or even in the first half I think it was there was a great block from no, it was second half sorry there was a great block where they got to the byline and cut it back and you think oh no um, and he just threw his body in, uh, on the line and it's that sort of stuff that sort of really endears himself to most football fans and then if you can add on top of that quality which he has with the ball um, yeah what what a player I mean if if he you know follows in the similar footsteps of most sort of big players that have come in this season, like your Townsends and your Barclays that have decided that they really like playing for Luton, and then, well, stick a cheeky bid in, I reckon. I mean, find out what it is. If you can't afford it, we'll crowdfund the sodding thing because, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we'd all love to see, I mean, if we got to see three years of Barclay and Laconga, it's definitely not going to be a bad three years. That um, That is for sure. The other person that I want to speak about uh, Dan is Ryan Giles. He came in mm. for a first start for a long time and you didn't really notice him in that first half. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a good way, because all you hear, all, all you've told is that he's fantastic going forward, but can't defend can't, yeah. and all this. Well, he was up against their best player in McAtee, yeah. who was anonymous in that first half. And a lot of that was down to Ryan Giles, but he didn't just stick with him. He got forward when he could do, but ultimately his job wasn't really to get forward because we had Barkley playing on the sort of left-hand side to to go into that kind of space and things. But, you know, I, th I think Giles is improving every time I see him. And now I can understand why he's our club record transfer fee. Yeah, I mean, I know a little bit about him from when he played for Coventry. Didn't see him when he played there, um, but not live anyway. Um, and obviously he played a, Big role in Middlesbrough getting up to the playoffs as well and always looked good when he played against us. So you sort of know knew there was a good player in there. Making the step up isn't easy for anybody. And when he was bought in, a record signing, plays a similar position to Doughty and you sort of feel, well, you know, is Doughty's number up? But Doughty's took that and just thought, well, when I get my chance, I'm going to grab the ball by the horns and go for it. And Giles has sort of been left behind a little bit. Um but he's he's come back in and what we've seen of him since he's come back in, I think he's took on board what what the manager said to him. And don't forget, he's he's a young lad as well, so he's still developing. Was he 22, 21, 22? Yeah, he's not much older, is he? No, he's he's not very old. And he's still developing him. He's still at an age where you can develop him and sort of mould him into what you need him to be. And I think very 
he's getting he's getting close to what we need him to be, and he'll only get better with match time. Yeah, he will. Hopefully, his injury is not too bad. He did look like he was limping when uh, they all came over uh, to the Luton fans at the end. But you could see that what playing for Luton means to him by his celebration after the Newcastle game. He was giving it lots of fist pumps, and I know that there was emotion around that uh, afternoon as well. But he seems to have, you know, he, he's coming out of himself now, isn't he? He's expressing himself. Yeah, I mean, they they all <laughs> seem that. I, I mean, you can tell that by the way that they play together and and, and give everything really. But uh, those celebrations do do say a lot, really. Um, and yeah, he hasn't. He he must have been frustrated um, for the first three months of the season because you, you get a look in after the first couple of games. But um, yeah, he's come in and he's done a job. Not wouldn't necessarily say he's done the sort of eye catching job of going forward that we'd like, but. I guess that probably was why he wasn't necessarily getting in the side in front of Doughty anyway. Uh, and it's a hard gauge to, to, to sort of play it by really because everybody in the Luton shirt sort of had a bit of a baptism of fire in those first three Premier League games um, since figured it out. Uh, and maybe he has as well, but you know, he, he was, he caught the eye at Middlesbrough going forward and he probably didn't have to do a lot going backwards, whereas Doughty can do the box-to-box stuff. Uh, and he's been a revelation this season, really, and I thought he was good last season. So um, that's that's probably put Charles, you know, second fiddle, but you, you've only got to listen to what sort of Carl Morris was saying after the game in terms of um, coming on and affecting the game, being a game-changer. And he said he, he wanted to do that and effective positively. And then Andros... Um, said that you know he's not sulked in the last four games that he's not been starting and he's come on and he's done a job and he has um and that's a sort of similar thing i guess that would rub off on the likes of giles and hopefully it does i mean go back to the celebrations and him really really happy that it has then hopefully he's 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 fully on board yep and uh, the reason why Carlton had to come off the bench and make an impact is because Elijah's playing so well. And they um, they highlighted it on Match of the Day uh, on Boxing Day um, that he's, his press going forward allows us to get up the pitch, but his defensive work, which often goes so unnoticed, but he mm. heads an awful lot of set pieces away, as does Morris, to be fair, when he plays. Yeah. Um, the work that he does in both boxes is is fantastic. And as I say... Had matey not brought him down, there's every chance he'd have gone through and opened the scoring before Alfie Doughty did. Yeah, I, I remember the incident you're talking about as well, and he did look clean through um, because he, he he got his first touch sorted out, which is something you could sort of accuse Elijah of not be, quite being there yet with the first touch. Um, but you, you you just see with him as the season's gone on. Like James said about baptism of fire, the opening few games, I think a few few players could be accused of struggling. Early on, um, Elijah being one of them couldn't quite get the rhythm of it. But like I said about Giles getting a run of games, Elijah's getting a run of games now, and he's really starting to prove himself that yeah you know, he belongs at this level. And he, strikers don't just need goals; the goals help obviously. But if your overall play is good and you can come and do a bit of the defensive stuff as well, you're doing yourself no harm whatsoever. And it seems like there's a there's an understanding with Morris and Adebayo as well. Like you don't see either of them sulking much about it at all like Morris's words to Edwards when he went on he says don't worry Gaffer we'll turn this round for you I'm only getting 20 minutes but I'm going to make sure I make it count and the, uh, you, you've got to praise the attitude of the players when they're not playing um, you don't hear them sulking like I said what time they get they tend to take the chances because it, it, it's, there's what 30 players in the squad there's only 11 places to start um, and another 9 on the bench you'd at the very least, you want to be one of the nine on the bench. What you really want is to be starting, but if you're only going to get 10 minutes here and there, you've got to make that time count. And Elijah was doing that and he's earning the starts and Morris is doing that now with his sub-appearances and trying to earn himself a start as well. And if that keeps happening, we're, there's no loose situation. No, really, yeah. And Elijah's really earned it. He has, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, delighted for Elijah as well, mm. because, you know, as I said earlier, he went through all that shit after the Tottenham game and... Um, mm come out the other side of it and that's good been a brilliant Christmas so far isn't it you know yeah. six points from six first back-to-back wins in the top flight 
in God knows how long. I think it's 32 years, wasn't it? And uh, To the day. It was to the day, 32 the day. years. And uh, the third win that came straight after that was uh, Chelsea. Uh, let At me home. just look at the fixture. Let oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> hello, Chelsea. Yeah. We'll obviously preview that in another episode. But this league table is suddenly getting a bit interesting, isn't it? And Newcastle, you had one sodding job. We did not <laughs> beat you on Saturday for you to go and lose a second game on the trot. All you had to do was beat Forest, and we'd have been out of the bloody bottom three by now. But we're recording this at the time that Everton are playing Manchester City, I should add. So going into that Everton-Man City game, Luton are one point behind Everton. They will have a game in hand after that Everton-Man City game. Crystal Palace have lost to Chelsea. We're three points behind them. And stuck in the middle are Notts Forest, two points behind them. All of, from From after the sort of... That nobody really cared about the league table after the Bournemouth game. Of course they didn't, but every result that could have gone against us that weekend did go against us. And it it really looked like the three of us were marooned at the bottom. All of a sudden we've pulled three or four in and then there's a couple more above that, Brentford and Fulham, who are suddenly going nowhere. All of a sudden this league table is getting a bit interesting going into 2024. It is. And I mean, all Luton have got to do is keep playing like they are and keep picking up the results, um, certainly at home. Uh, but if they can play like they have done away at Bournemouth for that first half and then against Sheffield United for you know pretty much all but 15 minutes of of the second half really I thought maybe maybe 20 from being generous um and pick up some points on the road as well um it's it is all about momentum you've seen what's happened with Bournemouth they've gone on a run They're nowhere nowhere near relegation anymore we thought that they'd be one of the ones that were, particularly when we were about to come up against them. Um, and and Everton as well, until they got <laughs> that 10 points and then uh, happened to go on a run. But you never know, that could dip again. Um, and lots of other teams coming back into it. I think um, it, it's going to be like that because we're in a league where there's so much at stake that when a, a team slips up as much as say Forest have done, they'll they'll bin off their manager, which Forest have done. You, you can you can well imagine that Palace might be the next one to do it. Um, and then do you get the new manager bounce? Well, it, it certainly seemed like that for Forest for a little while, but you never know. Maybe it's because uh, Newcastle were really struggling at the moment. They've got injuries galore and maybe, you know, beat, getting beaten by Luton is not good for your self-esteem for most of these teams that uh, think that they're bigger than they are. It's a, yeah. Um, so uh, it is really interesting um, and it, it is interesting to look at, but I, I sort of get finally where the players and the manager are coming from, where they're going, we can only really do what we need to do and concentrate on ourselves really. But um, it looks a lot better than it did, it did a couple of weeks ago. Well, it also looks a lot better because we got relegated on Christmas Day. Oh, yeah, no. Sorry, yeah. Garth. We didn't get relegated on Christmas Day, did we? And funnily enough, we are taking this damn thing seriously and everyone's starting to realise it. Yeah. Um, it's it's bit, as a fan, passionate fan like myself and like many of us, it's been particularly hard to hear these so-called experts writing us off before a ball was kicked. I think, I think they were writing us off as soon as um, we won the shootout in May. Um, and all we're doing is doing what we do best and we're, we're just being looting and that's what we do we like writing people off a lot of people said we'd never get to the Premier League hello a lot of people said we beat Derby's record 11 points hello mm -hmm. um, for the record I don't think that'll ever be beaten Oh, I've having seen Sheffield United on uh, Boxing Day mm. I'm not writing that off just yet <laughs> well <laughs> perhaps not Um but no, I, I don't think it will be. But no, we, it's, we we know what we're about. We know our club better than all these experts think they know us. And a, a lot of people like Garth Crooks did that with minimal research, lazy journalism, and to, to get clicks. I mean, the only thing they gained, there was a few clicks online, which is pretty sad, really. You know, if, 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 you're, the, if you're supposedly a top quality journalist like Mr. Crooks professes to be, of so many years, you'd, you'd surely you'd put a little bit more effort into researching how the club's run and what it's about and the type of players that we've produced over the years. And 
you know, and like the story behind it, he's literally just going, oh, they were in a conference nine years ago. They'll be back there before long. I wouldn't even say it's lazy journalism on his part. It's just lazy old school football punditry that sort of doesn't really take into account anything other than, well, these are the three teams that have come up. They'll be the easily the three worst teams, mm. and it's it doesn't. You know, it, well, he, you can, I, I can't remember the last. I, I don't. I don't know this offhand. I haven't researched it myself. So it's a little bit lazy on my part, but I don't know the last time all three went down from coming up. No, I can't say that I do. To be honest, um, you know, but I know that two of them are going down this year. Yeah. Just hope it's not us. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that. I don't. I don't think there's room for two of the teams that are above us to drop in. I just don't see that. I think we've. I think you know, one of us stays up, and I think it's. Yeah, I, I mean, I really do think it's. There's not been a point in this season where I don't think we can stay up, and this week has done nothing to detract from that. And I see this midfield getting better and better and better, and I'm just like, I'm not seeing a better one in the bottom half of the table. And it, um, it did take a little bit of time for us to get used to it. I mean, you, you can write August off, but last August we were crap anyway. But the thing in this league is, you have August in this league, and mm. then then it's a whole new league in September because everyone spent 150 million quid. Yeah. And then it's completely different again in September. And it's like, yet nobody writes off August for us. Everyone remembers August for us and how bad we were. Yeah. But now they're starting to get used to the fact that actually we're nowhere near that bad. And we're more than capable of going with teams in this league, as we showed in these last two games. And uh, hopefully we show that a lot more over the 20 games to come. That's it for this episode of the podcast. Very enjoyable one, as it always is, when we're reviewing Luton wins, of which we hope we'll be doing plenty more between now and the end of the season. Our thanks, as always, to the Hightown Club for hosting the podcast and our studio, uh, to Sean Grant and the Wolfgang for the intro music, to Ed Smith Creative for all the designs that you see on set. My thanks also to James and to Dan for keeping me company for this episode and to you for watching or listening. As I said right at the start of this podcast, please do keep your comments uh, coming in whether that's online where you get the podcast or if you see any of us in person uh, we'd love to hear your comments and um, subscribe like share tell everyone that you can about the podcast the more people we have watching and listening the bigger and better we can make the podcast and in in turn the bigger and better guests that we can get on as well um, but until next time, which will come along very, very quickly, because these games, as we've said all week, are coming along pretty quickly. Until next time, come on, you atters. Can you believe it? We are Premier League! Yes! I love this town. I love this town. I love this, this, this town. You know what I love about this town? It's actually you. Everyone in it has got this massive soul. We're looking for people.